from the contribution of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace to the World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance, held at Durban in South Africa in 2001. The Christian should never make racist claims or indulge in racist or discriminatory behavior. But sadly, that has not always been the case in practice, nor has it been so in history. In this regard, Pope John Paul II wanted to mark the Jubilee of the year 2000 by requests for pardon made in the name of the Church, so that the Church's memory might be purified from all forms of counter-witness and scandal, which have taken place in the past millennium. In its recent conclusions forwarded to the Holy See, the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination notes, the Committee welcomes the solemn request of His Holiness for pardon for past acts and omissions of the Church, which may have encouraged and or perpetuated discrimination against particular groups of people around the world. There are situations where the evil done survives the person who has done it through the consequences of certain actions and can become a burden weighing on the conscience and memory of later generations. A purification of memory then becomes necessary. Purifying memory means eliminating from personal and collective conscience all forms of resentment or violence left by the inheritance of the past on the basis of a new and rigorous historical theological judgment, which becomes the foundation for a renewed moral way of acting. This occurs whenever it becomes possible to attribute to past historical deeds a different quality, having a new and different effect on the present, in view of progress in reconciliation in truth, justice, and charity among human beings, and in particular, between the Church and the different religious, cultural, and civil communities with whom she is related. In this context, during the Jubilee year, a solemn Mass was celebrated in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome on the 12th of March 2000, in the course of which special prayers confessing faults and requesting pardon were offered. Among the particular intentions, there were confessions for faults committed in relations with the people of Israel, as well as for actions contrary to love, peace, the rights of peoples, cultures, and religions. After the confession of sins against the dignity of women and the unity of the human race, the Holy Father himself prayed in the following words. Lord God our Father, you created the human being, man and woman, in your image and likeness, and you willed the diversity of peoples within the unity of the human family. At times, however, the equality of your sons and daughters has not been acknowledged, and Christians have been guilty of attitudes of rejection and exclusion, consenting to acts of discrimination on the basis of racial and ethnic difference. Forgive us, and grant us the grace to heal the wounds still present in your community on account of sin, so that we will all feel ourselves to be your sons and daughters. Having already asked pardon of the peoples of Africa for the slave trade, Pope John Paul II took up this theme again on his visit to Senegal when he visited the so-called House of Slaves on the island of Gore on the 22nd of February, 1992. The Pope wished to make an act of expiation and asked pardon of Native Americans and of Africans deported as slaves. The request for pardon concerns the life of the Church, first of all. It is still legitimate, however, to hope that political leaders and peoples, especially those involved in tragic conflicts fueled by hatred and the memory of often ancient wounds, will be guided by the spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation exemplified by the Church and will make every effort to resolve their differences through open and honest dialogue. As our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, said in his address to the participants in the International Symposium on the Inquisition in 1998. In fact, in recent years, in Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, or Asia, at the end of international, inter-ethnic, 
or civil wars, or with the fall of military or communist dictatorships, legislation has been passed in order to seek the truth and identify those responsible. These laws have sought to re-establish national peace by offering amnesty under certain conditions. Thus, truth and reconciliation commissions, as in South Africa, were established. As non-juridical institutions, their mandate is to cast light upon these troubled periods and to identify the people responsible for them, without, however, condemning them to penal sanctions. Experience shows that such institutions cannot succeed on their own. Beyond the laws of amnesty, countries that have been destroyed and divided by serious conflicts must engage in a process of reconciliation. Reconciliation has further demands. No process of peace can ever begin unless an attitude of sincere forgiveness takes root in human hearts. When such forgiveness is lacking, wounds continue to fester, fueling in the younger generation endless resentment, producing a desire for revenge, and causing fresh destruction. As our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, said in his message for World Day of Peace in 1997. The Church is aware of the difficulty, the folly of this forgiveness, but does not see it as either a sign of weakness or cowardliness. Quite the contrary, the Church proclaims the way of pardon because of her unshakable confidence in the infinite forgiveness of God. Given this fundamental premise, the Church proposes concrete means of reconciliation which must be realized at every level. The weight of history, with its litany of resentments, fears, suspicions between families, ethnic groups, or populations, must first be overcome. One cannot remain a prisoner of the past. Individuals and peoples need a sort of healing of memories. This will require especially a correct rereading of each other's history at the level of education or culture resisting all hasty and partisan judgments in order to acquire a better knowledge and therefore acceptance of others. This reconciliation will only be possible if the various religions, governments, and the international community sincerely and actively opt for a culture of peace so that there is no more resort to arms in order to solve problems and there is an end to the growth of the arms industry and the sale of arms. The local churches have an active role to play, notably through their messages of forgiveness and reconciliation, but even more so through their action on the ground. It is the task of governments and world or regional organizations to put into place solid structures capable of withstanding the uncertainties of politics, thus guaranteeing to everyone freedom and security in every circumstance. All forms of mediation, therefore, should be encouraged. Existing structures must also be strengthened. In particular, the United Nations, which has done much in the area of maintaining and restoring peace, should benefit from means better adapted to the new missions entrusted to it. Yet structures and procedures will not be enough to build a lasting peace. Only the path of forgiveness will make this possible. As an act of gratuitous love, forgiveness has its own demands. The evil which has been done must be acknowledged and, as far as possible, corrected. The primary demand is, therefore, respect for truth. Lying, untrustworthiness, corruption, and ideological or political manipulation make it impossible to restore peaceful social relations. Hence, the importance of procedures which allow truth to be established. Such procedures are necessary but delicate for the search for truth risks becoming a thirst for vengeance. Often, as part of such a process, governments grant amnesty to those who have publicly admitted crimes committed during a period of turmoil. Such an initiative can be judged favorably as an effort to promote good relations between groups previously opposed to one another. To the requirement of truth, there must be added a second, justice. For forgiveness neither eliminates or lessens the need for the reparation which justice requires, but seeks to reintegrate individuals and groups into society and states into the community of nations. Such justice must respect the fundamental dignity of the human person at all times.